Aura, welcome to the Astro Ben podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm really excited. <laughs> good. I think with um, I think everyone's excited in general at the moment with Artemis One finally launching at the start of this week. So I think we have to mention it. Um, where were you? Did you watch it? Because you're in California, right? So what time was it in California? Um, it was in the evening in California, and um, I have to admit that I was uh, unsure if I was going to watch it because it seemed a bit stressful, um, and I did end up watching it in the end, but it was kind of a, a game time decision. Um, <laughs> a lot of these launches, it's just you know years and years of preparation for people, and there's always small things that could go wrong, so it's kind of a stressful situation, but I'm glad I ended up watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, I, I felt so relieved for all the scientists and engineers that have worked on it for so long and, you know, especially recently, probably getting a lot of flack in the media for, oh, it's cancelled again and scrubbed again. Um, but we know, being in the industry, that, uh, you know, things have to be, there has to be a high level of certainty that it's going to go swimmingly. And so far, touch wood, it's, it's gone really well. Um, right. It's, it's it's always better to delay for a few weeks and make sure everything's going to go correct than to uh, risk it and, you know, have a catastrophe. So exactly. if, if the engineers say delay, I say delay. <laughs> agree. Agree. Whatever the engineers say. Um, I, actually missed <laughs> yeah. the, I actually missed the launch because it was 6 a.m. And uh, I don't know, I started watching it in bed at like 5.30, like getting all excited. And I literally dozed. <laughs> I literally dozed for like 10 seconds. And that was like the first 10 seconds of the launch. So, uh, yeah, that's my bad. But I did spend the next few hours watching high definition replays, which is super cool. Um, so anyway, yeah, it seems appropriate to have someone from NASA on the podcast this week, but not to do with the Artemis program, um, but around your area of expertise, which is exoplanets. So yes. you're a research scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which sounds like an incredible role. Um, so, yeah, tell me, what is, uh, what is your role at the NASA Exoplanet Archive? Um, so I've been here for about a year now, and I have to say I love it. Um, so the NASA Exoplanet Archive in general is the biggest uh, archive or database of exoplanets. Um, so any planets not around the solar system, um, that's what we are trying to collect all the data possible on these. And it's a really fun um, and important task because there's people all around, scientists all around the world um, who are publishing papers about new exoplanets. Um, and NASA has invested a ton of money into discovering exoplanets through the Kepler mission, um, the TESS mission, and characterizing exoplanets with a new JWST telescope. Um, but those kind of just give a lot of data, and in order to get the most out of all of the data, somebody needs to collect it and put it all together so we can kind of understand what are the general population trends in exoplanets and what are, what are the best exoplanets to look at with JWST um, so that we don't waste time. Um, and so that's kind of what we try to do at the NASA Exoplanet Archive is collect all the data um, that's being put out in the field um, into one spot. Fantastic. So you mentioned the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which I'm sure everyone listening to the podcast knows what it is. Um, but yeah, you must have been really excited um, when that when that got off the ground and started releasing pictures for the first <laughs> time. How, do, how does it work? Do you kind of get to see the data before it becomes visualized into something that we non-scientists can see? Does the data kind of come in slowly and then you sort of build a picture of it over time? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so JWST was another uh, nervous launch moment, <laughs> which I did nervously watch again. Um, but yeah, so far the data has been really, really amazing. And the way that the um, proposing and data acquisition process has worked with JWST is um, there's been a few um, super collaborative kind of first look 
uh, projects. So there's been one first look project, it's called Early Release Science, for the whole exoplanet team. So um, anybody in astronomy who's interested in exoplanets can be part of this team. It's very collaborative. It's really great. Um, and uh, everybody uh, chose kind of a community target of what would be the best exoplanet to be the first look target. The data went public immediately, so anybody could grab the data um, and uh, try to reduce the data and get something meaningful out of it. And um, it was very collaborative, though. So a paper was published. Um, it was in August, the first exoplanet spectrum peer-reviewed paper. Uh, and it actually had four different teams reduce the data separately and not talk to each other and make sure that they got the same answer. Um, and so that was really cool, a very collaborative way to do exoplanets at first. Um, and so we released that spectrum that they um, published in this paper at the Exoplanet Archive also. So we did get the spectrum in advance um, to make sure that we can kind of uh, have it on the archive as soon as it was uh, released um, and press releases happen concurrently also. Um, so that was really exciting time. Um, and I think it was kind of like a win for science in general because it was super collaborative and making sure that different teams got the same answer. Mm, that's so interesting. So the, the, the Exoplanet Archives, it's obviously, it sounds like it's sort of very open for, for anyone to uh, dive into the data and but is there like a is there like a sort of ultimate archive which is literally sort of stored in a bunker somewhere um <laughs> on on hard drives obviously but um you know is there like a i don't know is there like a sort of an archive behind the archive is that something that you have access to <laughs> um so the exoplanet archive anybody can look at it you can just google nasa exoplanet archive it'll pop up um, it's pretty user friendly. It has uh, tables um, of all of the parameters. Um, there's documentation. Anybody can look at it. There's nothing secretive in there. Um, so we kind of have the like top level um, data. So this is, you know, the name of the planet. How big is it? Um, what team discovered it? Um, what's the mass of the planet? So those kind of like bulk properties that somebody would publish in a paper. We don't store all of the like underlying data. So that's all, there's like telescope archives. Um, so JWST has its own archive that has all of that unprocessed um, data. Mm. So I, I was reading that your, uh, part of your area of expertise is in, um, in brown dwarfs. Um, now I, I know a, a bit about uh, red dwarfs, and I, I, I say a bit like basically nothing. You know, I've heard of Proxima Centauri <laughs> and and Trappist One, which I believe are red dwarfs. Tell me if I'm wrong. But um, yes, yes, exactly. Those are the famous ones. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's the what's the difference between a red dwarf and a brown dwarf? Um, and and why is that your area of uh, sort of special focus within the exoplanet world? Yeah, so um, I kind of look at lots of atmospheres and brown dwarfs are really interesting. They're this intermediate phase between um, low mass stars. So that's kind of what people often call red dwarfs. Um, and those are actual stars, you know, they're, they're fusing hydrogen into helium. They are sustained for um, billions of years by fusing hydrogen into helium um, and their stars. Uh, then you have planets um, and gas giant planets like Jupiter in our um, own solar system. And uh, there's no uh, hydrogen fusing into helium in Jupiter, so it's not a star. It's cool, it's cloudy, it formed in a protoplanetary disk. But then there's this kind of intermediate thing called a brown dwarf. Um, which isn't massive enough to uh, get that um, density to fuse hydrogen into helium. So there's no fusion happening, but it's much bigger than Jupiter. And it is um, brighter because it just has so much mass that's condensing. So it has some um, heat 
due to just gravitational collapse over a long period of time. And potentially it can fuse deuterium, which is basically like an isotope of hydrogen. So it could potentially have like a little bit of fusion happening, but not too much. So it's this kind of interesting um, middle ground between a planet and a star. Um, and so I look at a lot of giant planets and also I look at some brown dwarfs and kind of see um, how they're formed and um, how brown dwarfs are formed and what's kind of the upper edge of planet formation and like what's the lower edge of star formation and how that all fits together. Wow, that's so fascinating. So does your job day to day yeah. sort of involve coming in and you think, oh, where shall I look today? And you decide to kind of <laughs> <laughs> look at some data from a certain area of the sky um, or are you sort of looking for, um, I don't know, do you, do you categorize them by where's most likely to be carbon or how do you kind of, how do you decide every day where to focus on and what's your, just talk me through like a, a, a day in the life of Aurora. Yeah, so my day is about half of my time. I work for service for the Exoplanet Archive um, and then half my day, uh, half my time, I get to do my own research, <clears throat> which is really amazing. Um, and for my own research, um, I think a lot of people just picture astronomers like every night looking at a telescope and I am an observational astronomer. So I do look at telescopes, which is um, one of my favorite things about astronomy. But um, a lot of our time is put into thinking about what targets we want to propose for telescopes because telescope time is limited. So I might only get one or two nights on a telescope each semester. So I really have to think about um, <clears throat> what are the best targets? What do I want to look at? And then I have to write a proposal that gets sent to the telescope and they judge all of the different proposals and they award you time based on if they like your proposal or not. Um, and so definitely a lot of my time is thinking about what targets are best, what's an interesting science case, um, and what's going to be like the most exciting thing to look at with a limited amount of time. Um, so definitely a lot of looking, thinking about targets and stuff. Mm. So what's, when you say telescope time, I'm imagining it's not like, I mean, I have a telescope. It was uh, <laughs> about 200 pounds from Amazon. Um, but I assume you're talking about a, uh, you know, well, a telescope that can see exoplanets. Um, so where, where, what facilities are those? Are they, uh, are they NASA owned? Yeah, so um, there's uh, space telescopes, of course. So applying the, the next cycle of JWST applications is due in January. So I just sent emails around um, <clears throat> to collaborators to start brainstorming ideas of what we want to do with JWST next. So putting in proposals for that. And then, of course, ground-based telescopes. Um, some of the biggest telescopes in the world are in Hawaii um, and in Chile. So um, those are, of course, kind of the prized facilities to go after because the larger the telescope, the better um, uh, quality data you're going to get. Um, and so when we're looking for really small signals in exoplanets, uh, you kind of need a pretty big telescope to look at that, those really small signals. So most of my research um, I don't actually do like the discovering of exoplanets. Um, my research is mostly focused on once they're discovered, finding the best ones to actually characterize with JWST or ground-based telescopes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, most of the telescopes that I use are kind of those bigger ones. That's so cool. Now I'm going I'm to put you on the spot a little bit. And if you can't say, don't worry, but what, <laughs> what was your business case or your, your scientific case for using the JWST? what um what in particular would you love if you could take control of it for i don't know how long it takes to capture an image um but uh you know what's your what's in your sights what are you, what and why you know would you focus it on a certain area of the sky i think some of the most exciting things that jwst is going to do which has not been possible with any other telescope is look at the atmospheres of small planets. So with ground-based telescopes or with Hubble, we've looked at the atmospheres of gas giant planets um, just because those atmospheres are bigger and the signal is gonna be bigger. But we really have not been able to look at the atmosphere of any planet smaller than 
Neptune type size. Um, so we have no idea what the atmosphere of a rocky exoplanet looks like. So I think that that's one of the most exciting JWST applications. Um, and so I have a collaborator who's working on a proposal to look at kind of um, uh, Neptune down to Earth-like size planets. So that's something that I'm really excited about. And then also um, kind of on the uh, brown dwarf to giant planet um, scale, JWST has opened up a huge new area um, in parameter space. So with um, ground-based telescopes, you can't really look at wavelengths too far in the infrared because our atmosphere basically completely blocks out those wavelengths. Um, our atmosphere absorbs lots of infrared light. So if you have a telescope on Earth and you try to look at something at an uh, infrared wavelength, you're not gonna be able to see anything because our atmosphere just absorbs everything. So you need a space telescope. And um, the only space telescope we've had before that does infrared wavelengths is Spitzer Space Telescope, but that was really only um, four data points. It wasn't a spectrum, it was just four different um, uh, filters on a camera. Um, and so it was more of a picture than a spectrum. So JWST is like the first time that we have this new window. Um, and with brown dwarfs and giant planets, you get much better signals. So we're gonna get these beautiful spectra of this brand new part of the wavelength space for the first time. Um, and so there's lots of really exciting things that are hopefully going to be um, revealed with this brand new area of wavelengths. Wow. What a, what a moment for you. When that finally happens, that's going, to be an, that's going to be an incredible moment for you when that finally happens. And, uh, and, what, and what is the actual process? So say you get the approval and you get um, JWST time. Do you, um, do you physically have to go to a control room somewhere and assist them with the repositioning? Or is it kind of all done for you and you just get sent the data one day and you get a first look and then and then the information gets put on the uh you know on the archive how does that work yeah it's a bit um <clears throat> for jwst it's a bit uh anticlimactic because they do everything for you um it has to be scheduled so precisely um <clears throat> that they do all the scheduling so you put in a proposal you tell them you have to go through the process of telling them like exactly what setting of the instrument you want. These are all the potential nights that um, my target would be viewable. Or if you're looking for um, a transiting planet, you have to tell them these are all the times the planet is transiting. You can choose any of them. Um, <clears throat> but then they do all the scheduling. They do the pointing um, and stuff for you and your data uh, comes down and you download it from the JWST archive. So um, a little bit less anticlimactic uh, because you're not, you know, like sitting there uh, with your computer controlling a space telescope or anything, but uh, probably a good thing that a lot of astronomers aren't uh, controlling a giant space telescope at their computers. <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely get someone that would try and turn it around and take a selfie of Earth. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, when people, when people think about exoplanets, so when I think about exoplanets, I think of like trying to find another Earth, so Earth 2.0. Um, what's your professional and personal um, predictions of that? You know, are we going to see in our lifetimes discovery of another Earth? You know, we're probably not going to get there yet. Um, and if that did happen, you know, how would that, how would the Earth react? Do you think we would, do you think we would care? Or do you think it would be sort of front page news for a couple of days and then we'd get distracted? <laughs> um, I think it, I think we definitely, well, okay. Um, so far we have not found any planets that are exactly like the earth. And that is just because of the sensitivity that our instruments currently have. So we don't, we have not found an exoplanet that's around a star that's a similar size to the sun, that's a similar size to the Earth, and that's at a similar distance from its host star. We don't have that yet. Um, 
And that's just because the way that we've been looking for exoplanets, it's really difficult to find that type of planet. With the transit technique, um, you have to have that chance alignment that the planet passes in front of the star and you look for a dip in brightness. And when the planet is that far away from the host star, the chance that it's going to be aligned and transiting goes down with distance. Um, and then you need to be, in order to be sure that the planet, that you caught a transit and not just a random dip in brightness, you have to usually see three transits. So we have to be staring at a sun-like star for at least three years um, and hope to see one of these. And the way that our transit surveys are set up, that's really difficult. And then the other technique that we've been using so far is the radial velocity technique. So with that, we're looking for small changes in the velocity of the host star because of the um, planet's gravitational pull on the star. So you always think about um, uh, Earth orbiting the sun, but actually the sun is also orbiting um, a center of gravity that's slightly offset from where um, it would be if there was no planet. Um, and so we're looking for that small wiggle. And what we're looking for is 10 centimeters per second for an Earth-like planet. That's tiny. Think of 10 centimeters. And then think of trying to measure that on stars that are, you know, uh, light years away. It's really, it's really challenging. So we haven't been able to do that so far. Um, I think <clears throat> actually in the next five to 10 years, we are going to be able to see our first Earth-like planet around a sun-like star with a new technique that's going to be coming online um, soon with the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So this is kind of the next large mission after JWST, and it's going to use microlensing um, as a technique to look for exoplanets. And what's interesting about this technique is you don't really get much information um, Oftentimes you can't even follow up the planet because it's a chance alignment of a star passing in front of a bright source and because of gravitational lensing, so that's like Einstein's theory that light is bent by gravity, um, you get a brightening. Um, and so it's you can't even follow up most of these sources. They're super far away, but that's actually going to be really good at finding Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. So I think in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see how, how common an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star is, but it might not be super exciting um, because we won't be able to follow up a lot of these systems. So we won't be able to look and be like, oh, is there water in the atmosphere? Um, and they're gonna be really far away. They're not gonna be around the closest systems. So again, if we want to, you know, think about going to sending a probe to a planet, it's not going to be around any of these systems. So it's kind of like a, a trade off. So we will, I think, very soon get to know how common Earths are. Um, but we won't really get to characterize it. I think the first chance that we're going to get to characterize a real Earth like planet um, is uh, so, so every 10 years. Um, bunch of scientists get together and come up with what's the next big telescope that should come out. So JWST came out of this like 20 years ago. So the next proposed mission is um, a mission to try to characterize 10 actual Earth-like planets um, around sun-like stars. So that's going to be maybe like 30 or 40 years in the future, maybe. <laughs> Which that's my the... really long answer. Sorry. No, that's so fascinating. You're very, you're very good at um, communicating because I'm, I, I normally when I hear scientists talk about exoplanets, I kind of, I struggle to follow what you're explaining, but I, I did follow it. So that's a testament to you, Thank you and your uh, communication. <laughs> um, and you know, speaking of that, I know you, 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 you do a, a fair bit of outreach um, yourself with um, the Girls Science Club and the Women as Leaders in Astronomy. Um, so tell me about them. How did you how did you get involved in those organizations and and what advice would you give to girls, especially listening to this podcast that, you know, may want to sort of get involved in astronomy? And, you know, would, would you suggest they join those sorts of organizations to, uh, you know, get involved? 
Oh, great. I'm glad that I get to talk about this. Um, yeah, I think that just exposure to science when you're younger um, and uh, seeing science as something that's fun and accessible to all different types of people is super important. Um, something like, I mean, the reason I got excited about space and science when I was little was things like the Artemis launch um, or, you know, um, uh, space things on the news and sci-fi. So I think it's super important to um, get young people excited about science. And I feel really optimistic because it seems like space is super cool right now. Um, <laughs> I went to like H&M the other day and they sold like NASA sweaters. <laughs> so <laughs> space seems cool now. Um, and uh, uh, I think that space um, is a great way to get people excited about science and excited about learning. Um, and just kind of getting that like initial curiosity um, about your surroundings um, and whether it leads to people becoming astronomers or just, um, you know, inquisitive uh, uh, people in general, like excited about the world around them um, is is just a, a really important thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my reasons for why I'm passionate about this and why I, I like to help. Um, and so uh, I try to like volunteer um, and get people, get young people uh, interested in science. Fantastic. And I think that's, that's obviously the main aim of Artemis is to, you know, put the first person of color on the moon, the first woman on the moon. And I think those things are, you know, they're not just for PR reasons, they are about inspiring the next generation. And, you know, we're yeah, gonna... representation's important. But it's, 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 it's everything, you know, and I think there's going to be so many young people that are going to see this and, you know, design those huge missions of the future that, you know, the scientists get together and plan 30, 40 years in the future. Um, you mentioned, yeah, 100%. you mentioned your uh, love of sci-fi a little bit. Um, so thinking, <laughs> <laughs> thinking about the future, what's your, well, first of all, what's your favorite sci-fi? That could be anything, could be a book or a film. Um, and, uh, what do you think we're going to see in our lifetimes? So in the next like 50 years, what are the, you know, assuming we're going to get to the moon, we're probably going to get to Mars, but is there anything else that we could hope for in terms of sci-fi actually happening? Do you think? Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine what the future is going to hold. Um, I would love to see a probe go to another planet I don't, I don't think humans are going to go to another planet in my lifetime. Um, I don't think distances are just so far, but I would love to see even like a tiny little probe go to a different stellar system. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, another thing that I am really excited about that's kind of sci-fi-y, but like potentially could not be sci-fi, is like bacterial life in our own solar system. Um, how cool would it be if like one of these moons of Jupiter, like Europa or something, had some bacteria in this sub-lunar surface? Um, that would be just pretty amazing. Um, so it would be really cool if we could get humans um, out farther in the solar system than Mars, but I think Mars itself is just a pretty, uh, it's going to take a while to do that. <laughs> so I'm not super optimistic I'm, in my time. I'm very, I'm very optimistic. I think, I think we're going to get some, <laughs> I think we're going to get to Mars in the next 10 years. And I think we'll get to uh -huh. the moons of Jupiter maybe in the next 40 to 50 years, which. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm in for it then. <laughs> yeah, that's both of our lifetimes. Um, we'll be fine, but, um, yeah. We'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, favorite sci-fi series. Ooh, yeah. that's a hard one. Um, well, now that we're kind of talking about humans in the outer solar system, I did really enjoy, um, did you watch The Expanse? I feel like that was a really interesting take because so many sci-fi series are like, you know, thousands of years in the future where we have hyperspeed, whatever. The Expanse is kind of this intermediate where humans have... Um, explored the solar system. So I thought that was like a kind of unique and fun uh, take. Um, favorite sci-fi book that I've read recently? 
I really enjoyed um, This Is How You Win a Time War. Um, that's what it's called, I think. <laughs> I haven't um, heard of that. Oh, yeah. It's really cool. It's it's super short. Um, it's honestly kind of like sci-fi poetry. Um, it's like beautifully written prose. Um, super short and really uh, kind of unique sci-fi um, book that I read recently. And then, of course, um, uh, some other great ones. The Three-Body Problem. I still yeah. think about that. Um, I really enjoyed uh, a bunch of Becky Chambers books. Um, what else? Yeah, <laughs> I Are love you, everything. Sci-fi. You nailed it with the Expanse for me. I mean, that I don't know. There's something about that that captured my imagination. And I've since read the books, and you're right. It's like it's it's kind of it sort of makes it quite human the way they talk about like belters or you know just sort of bringing to life through visionary what it would be like to like go to the moon and that sort of stuff so it's um it's super interesting but look i've really enjoyed talking to you um best of luck with everything um and uh you know keep us posted on exoplanets and um if you do see any aliens you know <laughs> we, we, we want to hear about it <laughs> so far no aliens i think the first aliens we might see is uh some well i'm hoping for some bacteria on some uh planet <laughs> in the solar system or moon in the solar system that's my that's my bet of first aliens <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that counts it does count it does definitely does count aurora <laughs> thank you very much thank you